أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى we're going to take علوم القرآن علوم القرآن means what? And we're also going to do the tafsir as well. So as you can see, we're going to be taking two things. Ulum al-Qur'an, an introduction to Ulum al-Qur'an, and an introduction to tafsir. Two things, inshallah ta'ala. And as you can all see, brothers and sisters who are listening, I really think this is important that you do these modules. Because it will give you a very strong understanding of every science that you ever need to study. A lot of us read the Quran, but we don't understand it. And we don't even know the path to take in order to learn the Quran. With this, inshallah ta'ala, patience. That you all should show, you will reach a point, inshallah ta'ala, to understand what Allah wants from you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what I'm going to start with is uh, introduction for the introduction of ulum al-Qur'an and that is the virtue of learning this subject sharaf and I want to mention I want to mention three things inshallah ta'ala the virtue of learning this I'm going to break it into three points inshallah ta'ala the sharaf the virtue of learning the ulum al-Qur'an number one it's connected to what it deals with. The honor here is connected to what it deals with. Mawdu'u. What does tafsir deal with? It deals with the speech of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So the honor here is what? It's the kalam of Allah. It's the speech of Allah. I ask you all a question. Is Allah above and greater and noble than all his creation? Is he not? Is Allah not greater than his slaves? Then his speech should be greater than the speech of the creation. If Allah is greater than the creation, and he's better than the creation, then his speech should be better than the speech of the creation. Sahih. So the first one is, this science, ulum al-Quran, what does it deal with? Mawdu'ah. What does it deal with? It deals with the kalam of Allah. And the kalam of Allah is great. So that's the first virtue. Does that everybody understand that point? من جهة موضوعه what it deals with it deals with Allah's speech you're gonna learn understand this subject which is Allah's speech نعم yeah موضوع means what it deals with what, it, what does it deal with the second is من حيث الغرض أما من جهة الغرض what's the objective behind علوم القرآن this gives it a virtue as well how does it we get, we want from it Sa'adatu Darain. We want the happiness and the prosperity of this world and hereafter. Didn't Allah not say in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكًا وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى قَالَ رَبِّ لِمَ حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا قَالَ كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَسِيتَ وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى Allah said in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ Anyone who turns away from my speech, فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Allah is going to give you a hard life. You could be the richest man on this earth. You could have so much money you want. You could have everything you want. Wallahi, you're going to feel darkness in your heart. Why? Because you don't have the speech of Allah. It's funny because there was a lawyer in the UK, solicitor, very rich. In the UK, his name was Wilson. His son told me this story. His father was very rich, extremely rich, had so much money. So what he did was, he was so rich, this man, solicitor, he went to Australia and he saw a big, beautiful palm, uh, house, mansion, and he told his employees, you know, I like this house, I like this mansion. I would like you to do a background check and find me the price of what it's worth and, you know, buy it for me. So he went back to the UK. When he went back, his employees, they catch 
try to find out how much the price is and how soon they can buy it and whatnot. And they found out that it was one of his properties. From one of the properties which he owned. He was extremely rich. Min al ajaib from the fascination was <laughs> that he killed himself. Took his own life because life became very tight on him. No happiness, no joy, no laughing. He said, My father spent the last couple of years, years misery, sadness. For us, it's not grief because Allah tells us, Man amila saliha min dakarin aw unta wa huwa mu'min. And wallahi I saw when I went to back home into my country Somalia I saw a man he wakes up in the morning Fajr Salam alaykum jama'ah first line he finishes he goes to his house he has a plate a plate and he puts sweets on top of that plate seven eight sweets he goes to the market he sells it the money that he makes from it he gives part of it to his wife and the rest he sits after time in the coffee shop and he drinks tea Salatul Jama'ah he's in the masjid and in the durus he's at the front line he's writing his notes he's laughing he's smiling and he only has what? those sweets that he sells in the morning and at that time another fascinating story was a man told me he owned a business what did he own? he owned a a business and one night he closed his shop and he was counting the money. See how much he made that day. And one of his employees came, he knocked on the door, he asked for water and he asked for food that he placed inside the working place. So he said, can you give me the food I left in the... T-? So he gave him the food, gave him the water, he drank it, he ate it. And because he didn't have anywhere to live, he slept right in front of the shop. In the morning he wants to wake up from there and carry on from work. So he snored and his snoring was making it hard for the man to count his money. So he stopped. He looked, who is this person making this noise, snoring? He woke him up, he said, can you leave? He said, no, this is where I sleep. Then he thought, this is an employee that works for me. He hasn't got nowhere to sleep or he can't go, well he does have somewhere to sleep but he's somewhere far. If he make, he can't make it back for the money that he needs. He's snoring like this and he's enjoying himself. I am the owner of the shop. I have the money. So what do you realize? The happiness is not the money that you have. The dinar and the dirham. It's something Allah places in the person's heart. Two great scholars, Ibrahim ibn Adham and Abu Yusuf, they went together. They both had two breads dry. And they took that bread and they dipped it in the side of the ocean, in the water. And they waited for it to become soft. And they ate. And Abu Yusuf and Ibrahim ibn Adham looked at each other. And Ibrahim ibn Adham said, لو علم الملوك وأبناء الملوك ما نحن فيه من النعيم والسرور لجادلون عليه بالسيوف. If the kings and the children of the kings were to know the happiness that we have, they would try to take it away from us. ولذلك ابن تيمية said, إن في الدنيا جنة من لم يدخلها لم يدخل جنة الآخرة. In this dunya there's a jannah. If you don't enter the Jannah of this dunya, you're not going to enter the Jannah of the hereafter. And so they asked him, what is the Jannah of this dunya? And he said, Al-Imanu Billah. To believe in Allah, it's a Jannah itself. Happiness. Joy that you're going to feel. And this comes from the Kalam of Allah. When you study it and you learn the book of Allah, it brings you happiness. One of the great scholars that recently died was Sheikh Muqbil. Sheikh Muqbil, they said, he had not much daughters. Sorry, he didn't have no son. He only had daughters. And he was qalilul yad. He had no money. Very poor. Very, very poor. He said, rahimahullah, when I open Sahih al-Bukhari and I say, haddathana, I say, haddathana, he said, all of my sadness and pain that I had will all go. Haddathana meaning opening the chain of hadith. When I open the hadith book and I want to read the chain, all of my misery and pain and stress that I had will all go. So brothers, when you study the book of Allah Azza wa Jalla, you will find happiness in this world. And what awaits you is darajat, levels, that Allah is going to give you subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third benefit that it has, 
is al-hajat ilayh the need that we have for it in order to understand this science ulum al-quran and its tafsir is a backbone for any of the sciences of the religion you need it if you do not study this subject and you don't learn this subject you're not going to understand the religion why because what's the source of our religion what's the first source of our religion the quran if you don't understand the book of allah then you're going to forsake everything else aren't you yeah so we need it based on these three points this science is virtuous in terms of what it deals with it's the speech of allah in terms of the objective the ultimate goal that we gain from it which is happiness in this world and then the hereafter Allahumma barik it's also virtuous the third one is how if we want to understand the religion we need to start with this subject and make it our backbone our the first thing that we study the book of Allah Azza wa Jal we study what? the book of Allah Azza wa Jal the third one is the need that we have for it al-hajatu ilayhi the need that we have for it the hunger that we have for it. Now I'm going to mention, this is the virtue that's in it. What is the benefits of studying it? What are the benefits that are in it? Studying this science, of course the first benefit that it has is that you're going to understand the book of Allah. If you study this science, ulum al-Quran, you're going to understand the book of Allah. That's the first benefit that it has. The second benefit that it has. So we mentioned three points for the virtue. And we're going to mention three points for the benefits. The first benefit, by studying this subject, you're going to understand the book of Allah. I know it's closely in, interlinked, the benefits and the virtue. But I wanted to separate it. The second is... It's a, this science is a good weapon to defend the religion of Allah. Nowadays, the Quran is being attacked. Is it from God? Did Allah actually speak it? Has it been tampered with? Did it change over time? By studying this science, you will be able to defend the Quran and prove that the Quran, as Allah says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ That the Quran is actually protected. The third is the third benefit is the person who understands the Quran is raised stations. What is he raised? Stations. And also, what's our objective from this? This subject, inshallah ta'ala. Three. Our objective is three things, inshallah ta'ala. From this particular subject. And we plan to do, inshallah ta'ala. The first one is, we want to define the headings that are in this field. Like, Asbab al Nuzul. This surah is Maki, this is Madani. What does it mean? Also, what does it mean? Nasikh and Mansukh Abrogated And this is the abrogator What does that mean? We want to define those words We want you to understand When you read the Quran And somebody says to you This is Makki Okay This is Madani Surah Okay What does it mean? Are we all together? So this first objective is To define and explain Inshallah ta'ala <coughs> The headings that are in this subject. There are headings. Over a hundred. Rather, it's a thousand. We won't, we won't, we won't, be, able to go, we won't be able to go through all the thousand. We'll just mention the most important ones. Are we all together? The second objective from this subject is to study the correct way of interpreting the Quran. What is the correct way to interpret the Quran? How should a person interpret the Quran? 
Should I just open the Quran and look at it and use my emotions? No. How? What's the correct way? We'll talk about that, inshallah ta'ala. Also, how to deal with the books that the scholars wrote in this particular field. Which book is the most important one for me to read? Should I buy this one now? What are the methodology of the scholars in the books? Those three, inshallah ta'ala, after we finish this, bi'idhnillahi al-kareem, these three points will be your objective. This module will answer all of this for you. Am I making sense? How many lectures is it going to be? Usul al-Tafsir? Yeah. It's going to be ten, inshallah ta'ala. Sahih? Ten lectures we're going to take. Today is the first lecture. It's going to be ten more, inshallah ta'ala. And in those ten, each lesson, I'm going to give you a heading, and we're going to tackle that heading, inshallah ta'ala, bi'idhnillahi al-kareem. Fadal. What, the first one for what? Defining the most fundamental headings for this particular science. The second one is the correct way interp- inter- to interpret the Quran. And the third one is how to deal with the books that are written in Ulum al Quran and in the science of the Quran. How do you deal with these books? They're too much, they're over thousands. Shall I start with particular ones? Shall I not? Whose book would be the best one for me right now? How is, did that scholar author that particular book? We'll speak about that inshallah ta'ala. So by the time we take this module, the Sharjah bookstore, bookshop is going to go to the book fair. It's going to happen, right? So a lot of students are going to go there. And they're going to go buy books, Ulum al-Quran and its tafsir from the book fair. صح? Huh? But knowing what books they want and why they want it and what publication. Inshallah ta'ala. So today what we're going to do, inshallah ta'ala, is we're just going to define Ulum al-Quran. We're just going to define it. The definition of Ulum al-Quran and also how it developed. Those are the only two we're going to take inshallah today. So today's class is Ta'rif Ulum al-Quran. What is Ulum al-Quran? What does this subject mean? And also, what is the stages it went through? Are we all together? That's all we're going to do inshallah ta'ala today. Ulum al-Quran is a science that deals with Ulum al-Quran is a science that deals with matters pertaining to the Quran. That's all I can say for now. That's the close, that's the best definition I could say for now. Are we all together? So it's a science that deals with matters pertaining to I'm regarding the Quran. Okay? That's what it means. And some of the headings... Huh? So, Ulum al-Quran is a science that deals with matters pertaining to the Quran. And some of its headings are... And some of it, Some of the headings... Um, some of the topics that are discussed in this science is um, are qiraat the way to read the Quran what's the best way of the dialect of the Quran dialect of the Quran would that be a good translation huh? qiraat what's the best word what's, what's the best to use dialect of the Quran huh? Huh? Modes, recitations. You all understand it, right? Qiraat. We'll discuss it here. Also, what we would discuss is what? Jam'ul Quran. How the Quran was compiled. It's discussed here. How was the Quran compiled? Did the Quran get lost? Um, was it correctly? Was it done correctly? Also, we will talk about um, Asbab al-Nuzul. Each verse that came down What was the event in which it came down on? And this is a particular science We'll also be talking about 
the sequence and the order of the verses and the surah. It's also it's discussed here. Makki and Madani. The surahs that are called Makki and Madani. What are Makki? Is it, does Makki mean every surah that came down in Mecca? And Madani, does it mean every surah that came in Medina? Or does Makki mean anything that came down before the Hijrah? And Madani means what came after the Hijrah, even if it came down in Mecca. Does that make sense? We'll be discussing that, inshallah ta'ala. Also, an nasikh wal mansukh, the Quran getting abrogated. How does the Quran get abrogated? Does Allah say something and come back from it again? Can stories be abrogated? Or would that be considered lying? Somebody says to you, yesterday I went to Umarah and he goes to you, I abrogated that. Can you abrogate stories and information? Or is abrogation specific to rulings? We'll be discussing that, inshaAllah ta'ala. Also the Quran has ambiguous verses. And there are verses which are clear-cut. We'll be discussing what are those ambiguous verses. How should we deal with them? What are those clear-cut verses? And how should we deal with that? We'll also be start discussing Gharib. Quran uses words which are strange. Strange when I say it, I mean Gharib in the Arabic language is a word that's not commonly used. It's not commonly used. It's rarely used. The Quran adopts it and he uses it. Is every single word in the Quran Arabic? Or are there non-Arabic words in the Quran? If there are non-Arabic words in the Quran, then why did Allah say Quran and Arabian غَيْرَ ذِي عِوَجٍ And how do you reconcile between that? We'll study that here inshallah ta'ala. I'rab al-Quran, the grammatical morphology and the grammatical analysis of the Quran. Does the Quran follow the grammar that the Arabs know? Or does the Quran go against the grammar and make its own rulings? All of these are studied in ulum al-Quran. Are we all together? That's some of the headings that we will discuss inshallah ta'ala. Are we all together brothers? So now I've defined for you what the subject means, right? Now I'm going to go into how it developed. This subject, Ulum al-Quran, is the first subject that was established. It was the first established subject in the religion. Why? Because the Quran was the first to come down. And from that moment onwards, the Sahabas were memorizing it. And they were taking it from the Prophet. And the Prophet was commenting on the Quran. And the Sahabas were taking its understanding from him, salawatullahi wa salam alayhi. And then tafsir was already happening. Tafsir is part of ulum al-Quran. Are we all together, brothers? So this subject, which is known as ulum al-Quran, is the first subject in our religion that was placed. How was it placed? The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa was teaching his companions... He was making them learn it. He was, take, he was making sure they memorized it. Salawatullahi wa alayhi. And they were making sure that they memorized it. And that they understood it. وَلِذَلِكَ Look how their understanding was. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he said, مَا مِنْ آيَةٍ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَّا وَأَنَا أَعْلَمُ أَيْنَ نَزَلَتْ وَمَتَى نَزَلَتْ وَفِيمَا نَزَلَتْ وَلَوْ كُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ أَحَدًا أَعْلَمُ مِنِّي بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ تَقْطَعُهُ الْمَطَايَ مِنَ الْإِبِلْ لَا رَكِبْتُ وَلَا ذَهَبْتُ إِلَيْهِ Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he said that there's not an ayah that came down except I know where it came down and who it came down and what it came down on. And if I was to know anyone more knowledgeable than me in this book, on this earth, I would have gone to him. I would have taken my riding beast, I would mount on my riding beast and I would go to him to take the Quran from him. But there isn't. Walidharik Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, at that time no one knew the book of Allah greater than him. Are you, t- are you with me? So you can see how, how, how knowledgeable they were in the Qur'an. You also find Abdullah ibn Abbas, it was transmitted that he went to Hajj. And the day of Arafah, he did the Hajj. He did the Khutbah. And when he did the Khutbah, he took one verse and he made the whole Khutbah on one verse. And he explained that one verse. And you know what the listeners, they said? لَوْ سَمِعَهُ الرُّومُ وَالْفُرُسُ if the Romans and the Persians were to hear his commentary of the Quran, la aslamu jamian, all of them would have taken Islam. The way he pointed each verse out and extracted from it fiqh rulings. Are you with me? Abdullah ibn Abbas one day said, when Allah said in the ayah, 
when Allah spoke about the story of Ashab al-Kahfi and Allah spoke about the number and how, how many they were and the dog what did Allah say? لا يعلمهم إلا قليل not many people know the number of how many the people of the cave were Abdullah ibn Abbas said and I am from those little who know because Allah said in the ayah not many little know it are you with me brothers? little know it Abdullah ibn Abbas said وَأَنَا مِنَ الْقَلِيلِ I am from the little who know it and we don't doubt that because the Prophet وسلم, what did he do to him? he said Allahumma Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa alimhu ta'wil Oh Allah give him the understanding of the religion and Ibn Abbas was given the understanding of the Quran so much so that as a young boy he sat in the gathering of who? in the gathering of Abdullah ibn uh, Abdurrahman ibn Awf and Umar ibn al-Khattab he sat with the house of common as we say in the UK yeah? house of parliament shura and Abdullah ibn Abbas did not even pass the age of 19 he was either 16 or 17 he's sitting with big sahaba so Abdurrahman ibn Awf said ya Umar this boy is the same age as my son and as our, our, our sons take him out of the gathering Umar said there's a reason why I put him in the gathering there was a reason he said إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا فَصَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَابًا What do you understand from the Abdurrahman? Abdurrahman ibn Awf. What do you understand from this? He said, I understand this as that whenever the people become large in number, Allah commanded the Prophet and instructed him to increase in the adhkar and the dhikr that he does. Umar said, is that all you've understood from the surah? He said, that's what I've understood from it. Umar then said to the remaining other companions, what did you guys understand from this surah? And they all mentioned it. What they, same, roughly the same as what Abdurrahman ibn Awf said. And then he looked at Ibn Abbas and he said, what do you understand from this surah? 17, 18 year old. And he looked at Umar and he said, I understood from this surah that Allah was telling the Prophet, your time is close. That your time is what? It's close. Umar looked at the rest of them and he said and I haven't understood from it Ibn Abbas except that which you've understood from it and I chose this boy to sit with us because he has the book of Allah and Umar was the one who said Inna Allah yarfa'u bihada al-Qur'ani aqwaman wa yada'u bihi akhareen he narrated it from the Prophet that the Prophet ﷺ said Allah raises this Qur'an because of it a people a nation are raised because they held on to the Qur'an and they memorized and they understood it and another people they're just humiliated because they left the Qur'an huh? Hold you onto the Quran, Allah gives you a station. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Walidalika, look at the Sahabas, how they understood the Quran. At the time of Uthman ibn Affan, Ibn Abdul Bar mentions this in his kitab at Tamheed. At the time of Uthman, a woman came and she, a woman came. And what she did was, she committed, or she was accused of committing zina by her husband. Because she gave birth at six months. Are you with me? So when she gave birth at six months, her husband goes, look, this is not my child. So I've only been married to the woman for this time. She got pregnant straight away. She had six months. Can't be possible. This child is not mine. So Uthman radiallahu anhu said, come forward. We have to do, we have to do, because the situation doesn't look in your favor to the woman. Ali heard that this is taking place. He mounted on his riding beast and he went to, to Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Ali was at Kufa at that time. He came from Kufa, to, he came to Medina and he met Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said to Uthman, don't do it. This woman is not what she's being accused of. He said, Umar said, Uthman, Uthman said to Ali, hey, what's your evidence? He said, my evidence is in the Quran. The book of Allah. He said, how is it in the book of Allah? He said, didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدِيهِ حَمَلَتُ أُمُّ كُرْهًا وَوَضَعَتُ كُرْهَ وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا The pregnancy and the breastfeeding 30 months. How many months? Allah mentioned 30 months. Breastfeeding and how much? The breastfeeding and the pregnancy. Allah said 30 months. وَحَمْلُهُ Pregnancy. وَفِصَالُهُ The breastfeeding 30 months. Allah already told us in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah how, how long the breastfeeding is. 
What did he say? Well, walidat yurdi'na awladahunna hawlayni kamilayni. Two years is the breastfeeding. How much months is two years? Twenty-four. So what's this pregnancy then? This is called dalalatul ikhtaba'in usulul fiqh. So what's left is going to be the pregnancy according to the sharia. He said the woman is right. She's six months pregnant. No problem. It's affirmed in the Quran. Does everyone understand the point? Uthman, who we know, read the Quran inside out. Uthman was from the Hufad al Kibar. He's one of the compilers of the or worked on the compiling of the Quran. Ma'adalika is something you couldn't see. Ali ibn Abi Talib saw it. Are you with me, brothers? Does that make sense? So the Sahabas, they were like that when it came to the. They knew it's science. They knew how to deal with the Quran. What did they know? They knew how to deal with the Quran. So the Quran was from the early sciences that were written. After that, the Sahabas, the students of the Sahabas took from them. The sahab, students of the companions, they were, not, they were not joking. They wanted to take the Quran. From them is Mujahid ibn Jabrin. Mujahid ibn Jabrin, he went to Abdullah ibn Abbas and he said to Ibn Abbas, here's the book of Allah. Explain it from me word for word, from one side to the other side. Look what he said. عرضت المصحف على ابن عباس ثلاث عرضات. I opened the Quran in front of Ibn Abbas three times from beginning to end. أوقف عند كل آية. Every آية I stop him. I say, what does this mean? Oh, okay, next one. From one cover to the other cover, three times Mujahid said, I took it from Abdullah ibn Abbas. Are we all together? ولذلك the scholars they said regarding Mujahid tafsir. It's a serious issue. Sufyan al-Thawri, what did he say? إِذَا جَاءَكَ تَفْسِيرُ مُجَاهِدْ فَحَسْبُكَ بِهِ If the tafsir of Mujahid comes to you, don't ask for anything else. Take it. Why? Because who did he take it from? Ibn Abbas. And where did Ibn Abbas take it from? From the Prophet Are we all together? Also another imam, Abu al-Jawza. Abu al-Jawza, he said, جَاوَرْتُ ibn Abbasin. Ibn Abu al-Jawza, he said, I was neighbors with Ibn Abbas for 12 years. I took the Quran from him. 12 years I was his neighbor. I took the Quran from him. There are also from the Tabi'in, Tawus ibn Kaysanan, Mujahid ibn Jabrinan, Ata ibn Abi Rabahan. And the likes of these scholars, what did they do? They all took from the companions. Our religion, the benefits of our religion is that the Sahabas took from the Prophet, the students of the companions took from this, and it went like that, gradual, the darruj. And I want you to focus on one point, because it's very important right now here, which is what? In Islam, our religion was based upon memorization. I want you to understand this value, it's very important. The Sahabas, they memorized it, the Prophet passed it over to them, they passed it over to their students, and that's how the Qur'an was kept. 60, 70 years. Why am I saying 60, 70 years? 20 years back home in my country, Somalia, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, Somalia, you would struggle to find a mushaf in a house. People were memorizing it from the Qur'an teacher. He would dictate it, the student would write it on a big lower. Some students never saw a mushaf as children. They didn't ever see it. The Qur'an was done like that. So whoever says that the Qur'an was not preserved doesn't know how the Arabs and the Muslims at that time lived. Forget the Qur'an being preserved. The Arabic poetry was preserved. The poetry of the Arabs, Umru Al-Qaysan, Antara ibn al-Shaddad, Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma, Mu'alaqat al-Ashara, the pre-Islamic poets, the things that they said, they would dictate it and people would listen and they would memorize it. They'll go. And we have those poetries documented today. Let alone the Quran, which Allah promised is going to look after it. So the Quran is preserved in two ways. Number one, it was passed over verbally, orally. Sahabas were memorizing it and they were passing on. They said that Ubay, the companion Ubay ibn Ka'bin, Ka'b ibn Ubay, he memorized Surah Al-A'raf by hearing it once. All of Surah Al-A'raf, he heard it once. And he memorized it. He memorized the whole Surah. Once that happened, brothers, 
the Sahabas, we spoke about it, and then the Tabi'een, we spoke about them. Then came the time of writing. Documentation started. The Quran had to now be documented. Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as you all know, what did he do? So Abu Bakr, what did he first do? Abu Bakr saw that the reciters of the Quran are dying. I don't want to go too much into this because we're going to speak about it in more details, the Jam'ul Quran. All of these points that I'm mentioning, we're going to speak about it. We're going to speak about it in more details. But Abu Bakr, he commanded the Quran to be compiled. Now please pay attention here, okay? Abu Bakr, what he did was, he gathered the whole Quran and he brought it together. He did not make it one type of recitation. Okay? All he did was what? Jama. Just bring everybody, bring your notes. Okay, bring your mushaf. You have your mushaf written for you, bring it. Bring it. Everybody bring your mushafs. He brought it and he put it together. And it stayed with who? Hafsa kept it. Uthman lakin, he did unification. He united them upon a particular type of Quran recitation. And he got, rest, he got rid of the rest. Because the people were arguing and debating. And so he brought them together. This we're going to speak about in more details when? When we speak about Jab'ul al-Quran. From there, scholars, they saw that the science of Quran was so much. And they started to author books. Some of them, they went towards Qiraat and they wrote books. One of the first people who wrote in Qiraat or the first person who wrote in Qiraat was Abu Ubaid Qasim al Salam. He wrote, after him came, after him came Ibn Mujahid, not Mujahid ibn Jabrin, another one. Ibn Mujahid. He wrote a kitab called Al Qiraat al Sabah. And then from there came books of tafsir, like Yahya ibn al Salam and others. They started to write in tafsir. They started to write in Qiraat. They started to write in the terms and the words that are in the Quran. Books got written. And all of the books are written on your notes that were given that were given to you. So the Quran, that's how it became. I'm going to conclude inshallah ta'ala by mentioning one two points inshallah ta'ala, which is this whole class I'm going to depend on one powerful book. If you want to buy it, it's your choice, you can buy it. And I believe it's the best book if you want to read in Ulum al-Quran. Unprecedented. The best. The best book in written in this whole subject. It's the Kitab Al-Itqan. Fi Ulum, Ulum al-Quran. And it's written by Jalaluddin Suyuti. The beautiful thing is it's actually translated in English now, alhamdulillah. Yeah? So here you have it, huh? So it's translated. Al Itqan fi Ulum al Quran is the book that each and every one of you should try to buy. What's the translation? So here. It says I think precision in the science of Quran or something like that. It will be emailed, yeah? Yeah. That book, it's in English. Try to buy it and read it. Don't read it once. Don't read it twice. Don't read it thrice. Read it as much as possible. Huh? The author is Jalaluddin al suyuti He originally took it from the Burhan of Zarkashi. He summarized it um, from it. You're going to have to share that with your brothers, inshallah. It will be sent to you the details of where to buy that book. Please buy it. This book is gold, gold. Huh? It's valuable. And there's so much knowledge in it when it comes to the what? Ulum al Quran. The science that we're talking about, I'm only going to go, I'm quickly, I just, I'm picking things from it here and there to share it with you all. Lakin, there's so much gems in there. So on your spare time, just read it. And whatever you don't understand, I'm more than welcome to share, uh, discuss it with you, inshallah ta'ala.
If you have, if you go to Arabic, assisted risal is the best. With the tahqiq of Shu'ayb Arnaut, very good. Allah barik. Assisted risal is good. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. A question from this lawyer. What's the difference between tafsir and tadabbur? Tafsir of the Qur'an means the commentary of the Qur'an, understanding the meaning of the Qur'an. A person who does tafsir of the Qur'an does not necessarily ponder on the Qur'an. Meaning, to ponder on the Qur'an, you need to have understanding of the tafsir. Tafsir is the beginning before it. Tafsir means to have the understanding. And tadabbur means to ponder and contemplate over what you've understood. Are we all together? وَلِذَلِكَ The Qur'an, the pondering on it, is of two types. Ayat which it calls ayat shar'iyah. Looking at the grammar, looking at how Allah spoke, why did Allah use this term, and pondering on it like that. And how Allah speaks about Jannah, and how He speaks about the Nar, and how Allah speaks about this, and how He speaks about that, that's tadabbur. Are we all together? That's ayat which are shar'iyah, the the Quran in its format. Tadabur can also be that which is not ayah shari'ah. It can be the universal signs. Going out there and looking at the sun and the moon and how Allah created everything around you, this is called tadabur. This is not tafsir. So meaning tafsir is specific to what? Uh, to the Quran. Whereas tadabur can be what? The ayat shari'ah and the ayat koniyah. That's one difference. The second difference is that tadabur it comes after you've got a basic understanding of the tafsir. It's a fara', a branch that stems from having understanding of the Qur'an first. Meaning, a person who doesn't understand the Qur'an at all, to say, I'm reading it and it's in a different language and you don't understand it, tadabur can't, can't come from that. Are you with me? Even that though, uh, some scholars, they discuss, can you... Can tadabbur come from the recitation and the voice and the melody and what it has? Can that be a form of tadabbur? That's what some scholars mention there is. In other words, tadabbur is more broader than tafsir. Tadabbur is what? For the Quran and other than the Quran. Any other questions? Fadal. As we mentioned, when we come, inshallah ta'ala, in more details, we're going to discuss it. Thuruqu, tafsir al-Qur'an. How do we do tafsir of the Qur'an? What path do we take and the methodology to do, to do tafsir al-Qur'an? When we do mention the path to take and the way to do it and the structure and the layout to do it, if a tadabbur is not in line with that, then it's not right. Are you with me? the tadabbur is not in line with the tafsir that's taken, then it won't be a tadabbur which is sahih. With that, if you go to the tafsir of Sheikh Muhammad al-Amir al-Shanqiyati, when he came to the ayah, فَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا أَمْ عَلَىٰ فَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا أَمْ أَفَل how is it done? Are you with me, brothers? How is it done? Pondering and analyzing. Hmm. I don't remember word for word what he said. But inshallah ta'ala, we'll speak about the issue of how to do tafsir in the chapters to come, inshallah ta'ala. And the way to do it, inshallah ta'ala. Bidhanillah al kareem Any other questions? One more question. Yeah, from the yeah. uh, the the for a long time, and we do not ask, we, we have taken the knowledge from. Uh. Is it okay to ask the, the person who is the school who we have taken the knowledge from or not? Hold on. Uh, 
Allah, 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 I don't know why. Allah knows best. Allah, Allah, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't got an answer on that question. No. Any other question? Okay, can I just ask you guys a question? When we spoke about the virtues of the Quran, how many virtues did we mention? Question one. Okay, hey, what's the three? Huh. So the mawdu' what it deals with. So the first one was what? The virtue of the Quran in terms of what it deals with. That's one. The hey, second one was what? The objective that we get from it, which is what? Happiness in this world in there. The third one was what? The need that we have for the Quran. What is the need that we have for it? In order to understand all the other sciences, we need the Quran. صح? The second question is, there are benefits in studying the Quran. What were the three benefits that I mentioned? We'll understand the book of Allah by studying this science, Ulum Al-Quran. Beautiful. Second one. In order to protect the religion from those who say that the Quran is not preserved, on its, well, this science would help us a lot. Third. Allah will elevate our status. And we will be from what the Prophet ﷺ has said, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ أَهْلِينَ Allah has a people. Allah has a what? Allah has a people. وَأَهْلُ اللَّهِ And the people of Allah is Ahlul Qur'an, the people of the Qur'an. The people of the Qur'an are what? They're the people of Allah. Are you with me, brothers? Right now, I'm drinking from this cup, right? They use this to pour the water inside there, right? Sah? Brothers, they use this to pour the water inside, correct? Allah Azza wa Jalla has places where He pours things in. And you know where Allah pours things in? The heart of every righteous person. He stores His words inside there. The Prophet said that in the hadith of Imam al Tabarani narrated, Inna lillahi aniya. Allah has vessels where He places things in. Wa'aniyatullahi and the vessels of Allah is qalbu kulla abdin mu'minin. Every righteous slave, Allah used your heart as a storage to keep his words inside there. Another person in his heart, there are other things, music and whatnot. And another person in his heart, Allah is keeping the Quran. So it's a wallah is a station station. This is a what? Station. Also, can you mention the best book written in Ulum al Quran that I mentioned? What's the best book that was written? Al Itqan fi Ulum. Who wrote it? Okay. Who was the first person who wrote in Ulum? Who wrote? In, who op- Who? Sorry. Who was the first person who authored a book in Qiraat? Qiraat. Who was the first person who authored a book in Qiraat? Uh, Abu Ubaid Abu Ubaid Qasim ibn Salam Write this down if you haven't written this Abu Ubaid Qasim ibn Salam Was the first person to have written in Qiraat I mentioned that Qasim ibn Salam mm-hmm. It was from the 2nd uh, century Rahimahullah ta'ala mm. He was the first to write it Who came after him and wrote it? Who was the second person that wrote in Qiraat? Who? Ibn Mujahid. And you know what he wrote? He called it what? Al Qiraat al Sabah. The seven reciters of the Quran that we know, right? The seven Qurra that we know. He wrote a book in those seven Qurra. Jameel. We will leave it there, inshallah ta'ala. Any mistakes or shortcomings that have come from me while I was speaking is from me and Shaytan, and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أستغفرك وأتوب إليك بارك الله فيكم فكمين ما الله أنا يقول جزاكم الله خيرا